Good morning and welcome to Recipe for Success. My name is Nancy Giacalone and um, this show is about combining two things I love, cooking and business. And one thing I've learned about cooking is there is always one technique or ingredient that is the key to my success. And that seems to be true in business as well. I've got a really bad echo here. Let's figure out what's going on. Um, like I said, it's 2020, right? <laughs> It is 2020, sorry about that, um, folks. <laughs> um, anyway, so today I am super excited to have Steve Watson with me. He has um, a very cool podcast called Trend Breakers, and I'm going to allow Steve to introduce himself and tell you a little bit about what is a trend breaker. Yeah, so hi, I'm thankful to be on your show here. It's been a lot of fun following you on, on LinkedIn. The fact that you're doing LinkedIn lives now, this is this is fun to do. I know that I did a couple of them, you've done them, like to bring those two together. So what I do is I, I have a couple different hats that I wear. So I have a day job where I am a CFO of a company in Arizona, has about 500 employees. I actually wear my the HR hat as well at that company. But because those two worlds come together really around employee benefits, I like to geek out on employee benefits. So I started a community called Trend Breakers, where it's really educating my peer group about how to buy benefits in a better way. Um, OK, so you answered my second question. So we already know what your day job is. And um, with the number of podcasts that you've done, it is keeping you very busy. Uh, I've known you for a while now before yeah. Trend Breakers was even actually formulated when I know you were still struggling with the idea of what exactly I'm trying to figure out what am I doing when I grow up, right? <laughs> what am I going to do when I grow up? How do I art articulate this? But what I really want to know is how did you fully formulate the Trend Breakers idea and why is this so important to you? Yeah, um, really good question. So it, it... I, I remember sitting in my office, I was a new CFO, had been there about a year, and they just gave me the HR title. And we went through our first renewal. And I have all these letters after my name, CPA, MBA, uh, you know, HR certifications, all this stuff. But nobody ever taught me how to negotiate benefits. And in that year, the broker came to me and said, you know, I'm sorry, you, know, you had a really large claim, your rates are going up 30%. And just that moment. And so just think about it from my standpoint. So as a CFO standpoint, I am having to come up with hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay for the same benefits, you know, to recruit and retain, retain our employees. And like, where am I going to find that money? Like, where am I going to find $200,000 just out of the blue? And then the HR side of me is like, now I got to stand up in front of all my employees. You know, we may water down the benefits by increasing the deductibles and co-pays and, you know, switching networks and stuff like that, but they're going to get basically watered down benefits for a higher cost. And it just ticked me off because, and for me personally, in that I'm able to find value in all areas of my business, but for some reason, employee benefits was this black hole that I didn't know anything about. And so I started this journey of trying to figure out as much as I could about benefits, interview as many people as I could. Um, I actually became a CFO, a fractional CFO for a broker for a while, and got to peek behind the scenes. And I, I kept finding all of this information that helped me save a lot of money for my, my company. And now, what it's done to me is that I, I, it's like I know too much now. And so I feel like if I, if I don't help my fellow CFOs and fellow HR professionals, then I'm kind of complicit in this messed up system. And so I don't sleep well at night knowing that they're paying too much for their insurance, that their employees are getting these higher rates and stuff. And so I started Trend Breakers to kind of be this informational hub of people to help each other. Well, it's like you can't unsee what you've now seen. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the really example I use is like that movie, The Matrix from 20 years ago. It, it feels like 10 years ago, but it's probably like 30 years ago when that movie came out. But the point when Morpheus gives him the red pill is like, <laughs> you know, you're going to see this Matrix and do this stuff. But you got to take the pill. I love that moment. And I love that moment doing it for CFOs and HR professionals of them being able to see how this works and to see that they can do this in a different way. So. So one thing I think is interesting is I don't know very many people that hold the title of CFO and HR director. So that's unusual. It is. But in some ways, it's kind of cool because um, being on the broker side or consultant side or whatever, whatever tag right. you want to put on me, um, oftentimes we're working with only one or the other and they have two different agendas. So I think um, I think it's really important to 
bring everybody to the table. Oh, okay. Well, Aaron says unicorns don't back you down. You call me unicorns. I'm like, I, <laughs> like every I called, podcast I go to, like, hey, it's Steve Watson, the unicorn. I'm like, well, yeah. okay. My, my yeah. three-year-old daughter would really appreciate that because she just loves unicorns right now. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll be sending her a pink stuffed unicorn very All soon. Right. <laughs> so, no, but anyway, let, so, so how do we get both the CFO finance and HR to put equal weight on this issue? It, it's a huge problem. It, it really is a problem internally for my, my, my peer group in that one, we don't have anybody accountable for the financial aspect of our employee benefits plan. And, you know, the, we, we, we kind of have it in HR, most places it's in HR and HR is built to recruit and retain employees and administrative side of that. We don't hire HR folks to be risk managers, to do the accounting, to do the finance side of that. That's a financial kind of kind of stuff. And over the years, we've been taught, we almost create this confrontational atmosphere between finance and HR because the renewals get presented, it's going up 10%, or think about that experience with me, it's going up 30%. Well, I need these employee these benefits to recruit and retain employees. Well, I need to like pay for these benefits. Where am I gonna get the money from? Well, we, let's water. And you, so we like pit them against each other and so there's a lot of mistrust between HR and finance around benefits. Um, we're wasting the money, you know, we're not having good value out of these benefits and we're not, you know, being able to recruit and retain employees. So how, what do we do about that is one of us has to be a little bit humble around this and, you know, go talk to the other one. I was interviewing a CFO yesterday and said, how many times have you ever had somebody walk up to you with you know, operationally, HR, sales, whatever, and say, look, what are your goals for this year, Ms. Mr. and Mrs. Finance person? Like, what do you want to accomplish this year? How can I help you with my area accomplish your goals? Not once in, you know, 25 years in finance has anybody ever come to me. It's always me having to like go somewhere else. And that would go a long ways. And finance needs to do a much better job of understanding the goals of HR and not try and just come in there and just cut things and do things and create a relationship between the two. Well, um, I think it's uh, my good friend, Josh Butler, that how often says um, we sometimes give HR a P&L responsibility without accountability. Yes. So I think that is one thing that is important to me is that, it, that, this, that this needs to be a joint effort. It cannot be solved just by HR and it cannot be solved just by finance. It yeah, is something that, that, that we don't want to plan just built by finance because it'll be like this bare bones plan that won't recruit and retain employees. And we don't want a plan just built by HR because they'll have every bell and whistle in it and the cost right. will be way out of control. Yeah. You know, as one of the big buzzwords in our industry right now is transparency. Um, we want insurance companies to be transparent. We want advisors to be transparent. But I think it's also going to be really part of the what is going to break the trend. It is what is going to help change things is when there's transparency within companies as well. Transparency between finance and HR, why this is important and what the budget is and how we work together. So I think what you're doing is fantastic. What, what I love about the, the HR has so many really good ideas on like how I want to roll out initiatives and do things. They just have a really hard time getting it passed because all the budget keeps getting sucked up within, you know, insurance rates going up and things. They don't realize that they're sitting on a gold mine of opportunities within that area and so many opportunities to save money for employees, for CFOs and stuff. But they got to learn the, the math side of things and the financial side of things and take ownership in that. And if they do, they're going to have some amazing results for their company. Yeah, I agree. So um, one thing that I'm really curious about, there are a lot of people with podcasts right now. And let's face it, I actually load this up as a podcast as well. Yeah. But I think there's like 500,000 podcasts. Or something I mean, it's crazy. crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. But what makes you different? Um. I don't know. It's, it's a really good question. My my podcast again. I'm. I, it was the for me. It was the best thing I did in 2020 was start the podcast. And I just from a selfish reason of meeting some amazing people out there, from being able to connect these people out there. I think what makes my podcast specifically on employee benefits different is where I come from. Like I come from it as the buyer. I talk as the CFO. I talk as the HR professional. And so when I go interview brokers, TPAs, pharmacy, different people. I'm taking it from that buyer's journey. And those are the questions that I have that I, I think is pretty unique that I'm not trying to sell something. I'm not trying to get somebody to sign up for insurance. I'm not trying to do something like that. Um, but 
you know, it, it is a podcast. So, I mean, there's a lot of them out there and a lot of people doing some really, really good stuff out there as well. So I don't want to knock anybody else's podcast down. Oh, heavens no. Um, but, I think what you're doing is is really great because you're right. There isn't anybody that is talking about it really from a very holistic standpoint. You know, you kind of see the 360 degrees, which is which is awesome. I see uh, Clint made a comment. He said, great points. Oftentimes, health benefits is the second highest spend outside of payroll. CFO, the person that writes the check should be involved. So, you know, I think that just circles back to what we were just talking yeah, about. They is, don't realize that they can do anything about it. Like we just kind of group them together as EREs is all the terminology we use. And we have this percentage tied to it. And we just don't even dig into that area. And there's a lot of opportunities in there for CFOs to dig. There's so much, there's so much. And, and oftentimes, as you well know, the amount of time given to a benefit renewal is, right. you know, an hour or two per year for something that is one of their second largest spends. They spend more time choosing the copy machine they than do. they do their benefits. So if we go back to Aaron's comment about the unicorn, like a lot of people call me a unicorn is because I wear these different hats. You know, it's like the CFO hat, the HR hat, and then I like to geek out on employee benefits. I, I don't think, I mean, I'm not the best CFO out there. I'm not the best HR professional out there. I'm not the expert, best expert in employee benefits, but what I do well is bridge those areas and I can translate those areas. And so when somebody says this, I can help the other person understand that. So that I think that's been fun on the podcast of helping translate and helping people in HR understand the CFO and CFO understand the broker and broker understand the CFO. And so, yeah, that's a really that's a really good way of um, of of looking at it. And like I say, what I see is again, you're you've got that holistic yeah. three hundred and sixty degree view, and so you're able to turn it so that people can have a better understanding. So that's a really good point. Where do you want to go from here with trend breakers? Because I hear that there are some changes coming. Yeah, I, you know, one of, the, one of the things that this has taught me is you got to be pretty fluid, right? I mean, you've known me since I think it was 2019 when we were in, you know, the Q4I group and I was trying to figure out at the core, I want to help. I like to educate. I like to empower CFOs and, and you know, HR professionals. Where it goes has been kind of a fluid path. And I really enjoy speaking. I really enjoy whether that's webinars, doing LinkedIn lives, hopefully pretty soon we'll be doing live conferences and stuff, but getting up there and in front of a lot of people having a platform like a podcast to talk about these things. And so that's what I'm really pushing this year is as much education, training, information out there to help you know people take that red pill and learn more about you know the, the matrix, the healthcare system that's out there. So um, I think that's amazing. It's also my understanding that um, Trend Breakers is, is multiplying or growing. It is. Well, the podcast, is, the podcast specifically. So again, I wear these three different hats. And so if you go look at my podcast right now, I have, I interview HR people, learn about their HR journey. I interview CFOs to learn about their journey and, and connect with them. I have a lot of podcast topics on employee benefits. And I've had some really good feedback about sometimes it's confusing. If somebody comes in there just wanting to learn about employee benefits, but they see all these HR journeys, like it doesn't really make sense, or they're coming to learn about HR stuff and there's all these CFO stuff. And so on my side, you know, the number of podcasts I'm going to put out and who I'm going to be interviewing is not going to change, but to make it easier to consume for folks, I'm going to split the podcast into three. So Trend Breakers is going to be a employee benefit centric podcast. You know, anything you want to learn about employee benefits as a broker or CFO, HR. And then I just split off my HR journey. So you can go on to Apple right now and Spotify and Buzzsprout and find my HR journey, which is really chronicling the, the stories of HR professionals, like why they got into HR. What were some of the pivotal moments in their career? Like, what are they most passionate about right now? I already have 40 interviews with various HR professionals there. So if you want to understand what an HR life is like, go listen to those those podcasts. And I'm doing the same thing for CFO. And I'm not quite sure on the title yet. It'll probably be my CFO journey, but where I'm chronicling their, I don't know if that's the right word, but I'm, I'm documenting their stories of how they became a CFO and, and why so other people can learn from them. So I'm having a lot of fun with those stories. I, I, I probably have probably about 10 CFO stories already, about 40 HR ones. And just in benefits in general, there's probably 40 to 50 episodes. My, my plan is I'll probably just leave the historic trend breaker podcast there, you know, the old HR ones and CFO ones. And just from now on, it'll just be employee benefit centric. So awesome. Awesome. So, okay. Well, I have so, three, right. If you're already doing one, might as well have three, right. Might as well have three. So if you were talking to a fellow CFO or HR director, 
What's the one question you would encourage them to ask their advisor um, that would help them better understand or improve their, their benefit program? Um, I have lots of questions. I'll try and limit it down to one. The biggest one I want them to know about is what is their claims history compared to premium been for the last three years? And it seems so simple, but most people don't even know that. And so if they're spending a million dollars each year in premiums, have they spent 1.3 million in claims? Have they spent $300,000 in claims? Like how has that trended? Because that's the basic thing of negotiations of like, are you overpaying or underpaying for those things? And so very, very basic information, you need to have that as you move forward. Okay, you're allowed to add two more questions. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so that's the basic one. The second one is what what other ideas are out there that I haven't seen in the past, and there, and it's it's hard to explain, but it's like we're so close minded in my world of like these are the only options that are out there, and so we just assume that that Blue Cross, Kaiser, United, PPO, that that's all that we have to choose from. And the example I use a lot with CFOs and HR professionals is it's like you're trying to buy a car, but you just go to a Honda dealership and you're just asking that that person there, show me, show me the best cars out there all available. And they're just going to show you Hondas. I mean, because you're at the Honda dealership. So it takes you as the CFO HR professional to step away from a little bit and see the all the different options out there. And that's probably the thing that's been the most shocking for me over the last five, six years as I dove into this is how many different options are out there. Not saying that one's better than the other one or something like that, but and, but they're only seeing one option. So I want, you know, whether they're asking their advisor that, or they're asking the other CFOs that, or learning from it, they need to see what else is out there so they can find what's the best fit for them. So um, I think another, just, just throw my own question well, in there. Question. But, but, um, I think another really important thing to consider is what is the appetite for change and what's the appetite for risk? Because some people are willing to pay a lot more money because they are unwilling to accept any level of change. And the only way things get better in general is by doing things differently than you're doing them now. Yeah. No, and I agree. And I, I think 2020, we all got slapped with so much change in our life. And so I ran into a lot of people, even within my own company of, we know what we want to do. We know it's the best step. We know financially it's better and stuff. It just wasn't the right year to make any any changes. And so we just kind of punted on things last year. And if I throw in one last question I'd have is, who is the person accountable for the financial results of your health benefits plan? And I would guess that most companies, they couldn't name, name a person there. Uh, I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, Priscilla says, yes, options are so important. I, I agree with you. I mean, there's very few things we just look at one option and don't take into consideration what else might be yeah. be available. Oh, we've got another suggestion with a question. How about are you happy with your care you're receiving and your overall spend? That is a fantastic question. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't think people are asking that on either side. The no, advisors I, I don't aren't even believe that they can do anything about it. I mean, so you yeah. say, no, I'm not happy, but it is what it is, is kind of what most people would think. And they don't realize that there are many other options out there. Yeah. So how can people become part of the Trend Breakers group and or listen to your podcasts? Yeah, so the best, the best way is the podcast. So Trend Breakers, just search it on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, search search for it. There's new episodes coming out every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I, I have played around with some Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups. I just didn't quite get the engagement that I was wanting. So I'm still trying to figure out what's the best way for people to communicate and stuff. And right now it's the podcast. The, the website, trendbreakers.com, um, you can find me as well. Awesome. Well, I will be sure to um, drop a link in the comments when the show is over for anybody that wants to uh, listen to any of Steve's podcasts. They are wonderful. Oh, I right. might actually mention that I was on one of them. So I, I think episode that was, 49, I if think I remember that was one of the right. best ones ever. <laughs> I, I share your podcast all the time with people. I, I really do. You know, oh, I, um, one, one of the things too, is if people are interested in having me speak, uh, if you go to my LinkedIn profile, it's Steve Watson CPA or Steve Watson. There's, there's like a thousand Steve Watsons out there, but Steve Watson CPA, I have my speaker kit out there. So it's a five page document to kind of show my bio, my story, and then all the topics I speak on and happy to, to speak in anybody's groups. And... Wonderful. Okay. We have made it to the five burning questions. Oh. Okay. 
So what is your absolute favorite food in the world and can you cook it? Okay, so I'm, I'm a little unique here, you know, unicorn out here in that I love different things. And so I don't have a one unique thing, but I love travel and I love eating foods from that, that place. And something unique about my family is my wife's excellent cook. We have a, a box with 70 different locations around the world, states and countries and stuff like that. So every week we pull something out of that hat and then it, she has a list of like four or five recipes from that country or from that state that we cook. And so I love, so this week we're doing Columbia. So we had Columbia soup and Columbia hot dogs this week. And last week it was Oklahoma. So we had brisket and uh, Navajo like fried taco salad. Uh, we've done Washington and done Seattle hot dogs with cream cheese on them and stuff. So I love that. I love different things from different places and no, I can't cook them, but my wife is a wonderful cook. That is the coolest thing I've ever heard. I've never heard anybody say that. And I absolutely love that idea. Yeah. Hmm. We, I mean, I sometimes to... you just get stuck in a rut, right? You have your like 15 different recipes that you cook over and over again. And we want our kids to be able to travel different places and have a palate that can like different places. And we have this dream that when they show up in France, be like, oh, just like my mama cooked, right? Or in Spain or Brazil or wherever. So. That's, that is really cool. Okay. So most people probably don't know it, but Steve has seven kids. I so do. when he, when he says his wife is cooking, she is cooking. <laughs> so, it's so, a lot of food. So I don't know if this answer would be the same, but does your family as a whole, is there like one meal? Like when something's really special, they say, let's have this. So every day, every year on their birthday, they get to pick their meals. Um, they love ribs and chicken wings and anything meat related there. I have six <laughs> boys and then a little girl at the end. And so anything related to meat, they're, they're huge fans of. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. So other than LinkedIn, what is your favorite social media platform right now and why? Yeah, tough one. Um, I, I, I really like Facebook groups. I don't like Facebook and I'm actually really close to just shutting down Facebook. I've just been tired of it. Um, but there's some really, really good groups there. There's one called the Evil HR Lady. It has 6,000 HR professionals in it that's extremely engaging, different things. There's another one called the Unofficial Sherm Group that's really engaging as far as HR professionals. The rest of Facebook, I just left. I, I don't use Instagram. Um, Clubhouse, I've been playing with a little bit to see. I, I think it has a lot of perks to it, but there's a lot of stuff I'm, I don't know, we'll see. Yeah, I think I'm about the same as you. I do use Facebook and I love Facebook groups. Um, there's always great engagement in those. Instagram is for my dogs. They pretty much, it's <laughs> my feed is like 90% dog related on Instagram. And Clubhouse, um, I ha I'm undecided on that. I, I feel like it could just take up so much of my time. When I, when I have gone on there, it just kind of sucks me in and You'd, I think I, I like I really like being a fly on the wall in Clubhouse. So if there's a group and there's a topic and there's a bunch of people and they're talking about it, you know, yesterday there was a group of about ten to fifteen brokers talking about self funding plans, and so I just like it, and they're just like engaging and talking and doing stuff, and so I just get to hear their conversations. I've been a, a moderator, a panelist there, and talked about different things. Um, and what I don't like about it is like they almost need LinkedIn to make it work. Like I got to promote it on LinkedIn. They got to do everything on LinkedIn and push everybody to Clubhouse. And then I don't like the fact that you can't record it and share it later. Uh, so yeah, I, I and think you, can't, you can't really connect with other. I mean, you can't really genuinely connect with people on there. There's I, no I find it's to better like people that I already know mm -hmm. that I may just follow on social media, and then to hear them speaking for half an hour, you get to know them a lot better. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. We'll see. I, I think if LinkedIn bought Clubhouse and made it like a feature of like having these like talk groups or different things, I think that would work out really well. But we'll yeah, see. yeah, I agree. Okay. So if you could magically wave your magic wand and get everyone to do one thing to improve their benefit program, what would it be? I would have them decide who is accountable for their benefits. And it's again, such a it's so simple, but yet when nobody's accountable, nobody does anything about it. And so I was interviewing another person that they, they have a chief wellness officer and that's their job. And they only have 200 employees, but they're, they have somebody that's, you know, when things go up, they get bonuses and recognized for doing a good job. And when things go down, they're held accountable for, for those results. I like that. Okay. So what is your secret talent or something that most people would be surprised to learn about you? 
Well, one is the seven kids. That usually sur <laughs> <laughs> surprises people. But I, I actually grew up on a on a sheep farm in a very small town with a, a thousand people there. I, I loved out going out quadding, going up the mountains, and you know, at at a heart, I'm a really small town person that just interacts really well with people. And I, what's different about growing up in a small town is, you know, if, if you fired somebody at work, guess what? You got to see them for the next forty years. Right. There would be all the high school games and stuff like that. And so the way you had to interact with people is like you couldn't just be one and done with people. You had to build relationships and do stuff and be in it for the long term. And that's just who I am at my core is, you know, even when I'm, I, I had a post this past week, even though I've been butting heads with somebody on social media, I'll pick up the phone and I'll, I'll reach out to them. I'll try and connect with them. And not that we have to agree, but at least I'm, I'm going to be personable with them and talk. I think that's um, I think that's key. Building relationships is really the the, the key to everything. Um, I play the piano too. I don't know if people play the piano, but that's I'm. Oh, that's cool. That's such a, you know, pe people think like concert piano. That's not me. But I I play piano at church. You know, there'll be like three hundred people in my congregation there, and I'll get up in the front. I'll play the piano, or they'll have like a little primary class with the little kids. And I'll be like playing the piano there there with them and. That's so, very cool. Yeah. I have I have zero musical talent whatsoever. Yeah. As a matter of fact, no one wants to even hear me try to hum because I would be off key. <laughs> um, I noticed that um, when we were talking about what was the one thing that people could do to improve their benefit program that Clint did uh, chime in, um, surprisingly enough, Clint, and say uh, to redesign their program and add DPC. And for those of you that don't know what DPC means, it means direct primary care, where you actually have a contract with a physician and it does not go through insurance, well, traditional insurance anyway. So um, there's a lot of good things coming. It is more prevalent in certain parts of the country than others, but um, it is something that we are going to be seeing a lot more in the future. Okay, last question. Yeah. Who, who is the person that you have connected with or follow on LinkedIn that you would most like to meet in real life? Or if it's not on LinkedIn, maybe it's a podcast. Um, who's who's somebody that you, you would really enjoy sitting down and having a conversation with in person? Um, so it's funny because I, I really like Gary Vaynerchuk. I, I like his realness and practicality. The guy swears like crazy. So I don't know. <laughs> we could like, I, I was, I was joking with somebody. I'm like, if somebody would like put together like a filtered version of him, like I would pay extra to get like all of his content with all, without all the cuss words and stuff in it. But I, I like what he's doing out there. The guy that runs the, there's a show out there called the profit. Um, I think it's Dan Lemon. I think is like his, Yes, I really like what he does because there's the flashy Shark Tank stuff, and then there's like the real like mom and pop like how do I make this business better? And that was always my dream since I was a little kid of like how do you take some like a business, learn what they're doing, and make them better? And I really like his you know focusing on the people and the process and the product and and doing it in real life. And he puts skin in the game. He like you know he'll put in ha become half owner of the company. So he's got in this. So I, I like that guy. I'd love to connect with him and learn more and. Oh, that's a couple of them out there. Cool. All right. So are there any um, parting thoughts, nuggets of wisdom that you would like to leave us with today? Uh, I I really enjoy doing the podcast. And so if you have a new idea out there, different things like that, I'd love to have you on the show. Go listen to a couple of them. They're just very informal, just conversations. I don't have any dog in the fight. You know, some people are like, well, this part, this thing's better than that one. I like to show all the different options out there. And so I'd love to have you on the show. And if you're a CFO or HR professional, love to have you on the show as well. I hear your story because I have so many people coming out of college right now and they look at my title like CFO and like, wow, how did you become a CFO? How did you become a HR director there? And so I love telling those, those stories and love to connect with people about that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, for If anybody is not connected with Steve or follow Steve, please do so. Um, he always posts links to his most recent podcasts, as well as some really interesting content. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Steve. And everybody have a great day.